One of the ones that I, I really love is a company called HCSS. They are a um, construction software firm, so they make the software that helps large construction projects run. They had a new uh, chief marketing officer, Dan Briscoe, who basically turned it on its head and basically said, enough about us already. We're going to put the customer at the center of it and really said, what are the issues that they're dealing with? What, what are the problems that they're having? What's going on in their lives that we can be helpful for them? And what they realized is that there was a real crisis in, it is a real crisis in the construction industry that the next generation doesn't think of it as the first thing that they want to go into. Um, nor do guidance counselors, et cetera, say, hey, that's where you should go. But when you think about it, tremendous engineering opportunities, um, that the technology has changed just like every other industry. Not only that, but um, there's a huge infrastructure crisis in this country. So, so these are the companies who actually deal with that. So what they did is they put a competition together to, for their customers under the auspices of a concept called I Build America. And they essentially wrote stories about how their companies, how their individuals within their companies came together to make a big difference in this world that, that we deal with every day. You drive down the road heading to another job site and it's like, I did this job 10 years ago. I did this job 15 years ago. And then everything still looks good, right? And, and that's what we're about. For me, I can say, thanks to us, this pipe is good. This pipe won't be destroyed. And it was a huge success. They stopped talking about themselves. They started celebrating. They created a platform for it. They, it just, be, it took on a life of its own. And then essentially in, um, I think the eight months that they did it in that first year, there was a 54% increase in annual revenue. It became something that they really embraced and in fact, um, they expanded it out not to just their customers but to the entire industry and was actually sort of adopted by the industry association. So they became part of the community. They, they thought of medium in a, in a much broader way. They saw how um, having these networks inspired uh, their employees as well to really get behind this. It's a, it's, I think it's a great example of how all those different pieces came together. IBM has really been doing a good job in this respect. Uh, starting with uh, the fact when they changed their traditional evaluation, which was based on share of mainframe that is sold in, from the 60s to the 90s, and they switched to basically share of computing, which led them to move away from the focus on hardware, uh, which today is less than 10% basically of their, their assets. Uh, and then recently when they're moving into basically creating an, an internal agency, they basically have an interactive agency they're creating. Uh, and then the focus they're doing today on what's on basically what's on health, what's on financials and so on. So I think IBM is a really great example in this area. Another one will be Nike and especially how Nike moved from selling just product to Nike Plus, which really created an amazing kind of network. The other kind of uh, interesting examples will be companies that uh, primarily emerge in respond to the changes in the business model, which is toward open innovation. So open innovation is probably one of the major paradigm shifts that we see in today's environment and uh, of huge impact. So I think there are tons of these examples out there of companies who are leveraging the force of change and primarily uh, this happens in the domain of startups. Large companies, especially legacy companies, uh, who start realizing this, start also realizing that it's very difficult to try to be truly innovative and especially breakthrough innovation in a large company. So one of the things that many of them do is try to create accelerators, internal accelerators. So if you look at, um, for example, most of the major technology companies, IBM, Google, Facebook, Amazon, uh, all of them have major R&D facilities in Israel. And every one of these R&D operations there, they have internal accelerators to try to capture and become a magnet to all the startups who work in the given area that they're interested in. So that's one way in which larger companies are realizing this and they're trying to, how do we leverage then the ecosystem of startups out there? I have one other quick example that sure. I think is really um, fun and that is the Lowe's Innovation Labs. Everything we're working on inside of the Lowe's Innovation Labs is stuff that no one ever would think that Lowe's would be coming out with, ever. So it's really wonderful what, and essentially what they do is it's kind of like a sandbox. They 
take a look at all the different technologies, really on science and technology, um, to really see how do they take these and um, create new environments for their customers. So in their stores and how they look at it, how they communicate. One of the things is called a hollow room. So it's a 3D sort of um, uh, VR uh, in store where you can actually create uh, with the products that they have your own room so that you can imagine and see and visualize it before you actually make your purchase. And so they have that in a few of their stores. Um, they're also doing a lot of work in the neuroscience area and in the biometrics to really understand from a behavioral perspective, how are people interacting with them? How are they searching? How are they looking for things? How can they make the whole shopping experience, the whole home improvement experience, basically these are people's home environments far easier to, uh, to interact with and to make uh, great for their homes and their lives. So it's, it's, it's really exciting to see how they're taking a hold of it and really putting it out into the real world. The, the other one that I, I, I really love as an example is actually out of India. Um, and someone we've worked with over the years, we had a, a session in, uh, in New Delhi a few years back. Um, Josie Paul's the chairman of BBDO. And they um, think very, very differently about how they work with their clients. And there's an example in particular for Ariel, which is a laundry detergent. Um, and he talks about it and says, don't make ads, uh, create invitations. And so really they, they took this whole concept of, they looked at what was going on in the Indian society and found that more women were moving into the working, uh, into the working world and yet the roles at home were not really keeping up with it. Um, and so they created a, a somewhat traditional uh, TV ad as part of the campaign, which essentially shows a father um, who's living with his um, married daughter and son and their child, and the son-in-law is sitting on the couch, and the daughter comes home from work, and there she goes doing the laundry. And he, it hits him, like, this is how I've raised our, the next generation. And of course, it's a very heartwarming story. And the concept again, across the board is called share the load. And it became actually a movement in India. And whereas uh, designers, and this is about the changing media landscape, designers, clothing designers actually in uh, for their cleaning labels, changed their cleaning labels so that it says, you know, hot water, cold water, how to dry it. And the fact that it can be washed by both men and women. Um, so very sort of tongue in cheek. When you actually opened up the box, there's instructions for how to do the laundry. So they really thought very, very holistically across all touch points. And they did it in such a way that they weren't trying to create a movement, but they were creating a, a platform. So not ads, but actions. And I think that whole mentality, a very humble one, something that really was uh, part of it. And of course they became viral in no time. They got a tremendous amount of uh, publicity, but it was because of, of how they were doing it. It wasn't a stunt. It was really very fundamental to who it was. So that that's really starting to move the whole relationship, the infrastructure, the process, the, the way that they're thinking about um, individuals in society. I, I love Catherine's example and would like to emphasize like two, two conclusions that I draw from here that hopefully will be helpful for your students. One is the importance of platforms. And how do you really create today the right platform as a kind of business model? And primarily start thinking about the advertising and the communication. How do I create a platform that will engage the consumers and others involved there? The other point, which is really critical in the example Catherine brought is, let's not focus only in the US. Let's start looking outside. And India is a great place to show some really creative things. Just think about the example of Colgate, which created basically yeah. educational, mat educational material uh, as opposed to just selling the kind of uh, the product basically created educational material about oral hygiene. Well, but it, like. but it, but interestingly, it was the boxes that the toothpaste was sent in when they first went into Myanmar. The boxes themselves, when you opened them up, the inside of the box was oral health, and they were um, done through with uh, the local art uh, styles. So there were very traditional styles of, of, of representation of it that then were opened up and then there were apps for um, the schools to then use it. And so it was really, as Jerry said, and that's why I think even communication doesn't quite get to it. 
because it's really about platforms and all the interactive nature of it. So we have to start thinking about how do we create then portfolios of touch points which are relevant for the consumer. And I think all of these examples, the packaging, for example, and the educational that goes around this and the apps that relate to this are all part of this kind of rethinking beyond media to start thinking about all touch points. I think it's also a really good example of the other critical notion of it. Um, if you were cynical, you'd say, well, pff, yeah, of course they did that because if they learn about oral health, they're going to realize that brushing your teeth more often is a better thing. And we're like, yeah, it's okay. Yes, it is self-serving. We're not expecting brands to all of a sudden, you know, save the whales, everybody, or, you know, to, to sort of give up. Um, but win, win, win. Create win, win, win. So certainly win for the company because their product is in there, but win for the individual as well as win for society in, in, in general or communities, either in a global perspective or at a very local perspective. And then there's co-creation. In this day and age where it's interactive, you're actually getting information about that individual. You're getting information about who they are and what their purchase habits are, tremendous amount of information, and then the brand has the opportunity to then deliver incremental value in exchange for that. So the whole relationship, again, between the brand and the individual changes, and the opportunity at that intersection between brand and people for value co-creation that then, in addition, has a sort of a halo effect or externalities um, to something else that's good in society. That's an extremely important point. So let me try to make sure that we, kind of, every one of the listeners understand the distinction here. Uh, Catherine talked about more data, big data, which today people relate this to big data and, and analytics, predictive analytics, the combination with AI, with other kind of uh, uh, sophisticated approaches. Uh, that's great and provides companies a huge amount of data, but that's not enough. That's not the co-creation we're talking about. We're talking here about the need actually to start creating platform to engage the consumers and others in co-creation activities. And there's a lot of research in terms of, for example, new product development that shows that co-creating products with consumers lead to by far better results than just using input from consumers into the R&D group that designs a new product. The same applies in the advertising communication area. So the co-creation is really a critical, critical component here. Uh, and it's not either or, it's not this versus the big data analytic. You really need both. 